Thank you very much, Felix, for joining us today on this week's installment of Startup Weekly. Felix is the head of growth marketing for the Asia Pacific um, arm of Angel Hub. And um, he's also a growth hacker, um, entrepreneur, and speaker. So, Felix, thank you very much for joining us today. No problem. Thanks for having me. Great. No worries. It's a pleasure. So, maybe you can start by giving us just a little bit of background about yourself and what you do at Angel Hub, and then also some of the other work that you do. Sure. Sounds great. Um, hi, everyone. I'm currently working for uh, Angel Hub, as uh, Gordon mentioned just now, uh, leading up the growth of Asia Pacific. So in short, the Angel Hub is a startup investment platform where we're investing uh, C2 Series A companies, mostly in Southeast Asia and also Europe. Um, we have been operating for around two years, headquartered in Hong Kong. We do have a small presence in London and Israel. Uh, been investing in a few portfolio companies such as uh, FinTech, e-commerce and, and logistics as well. So we are pretty industry agnostic and welcome any uh, startups from different sectors. My responsibility, including overseeing the whole digital footprint of our firm, um, scouting potential companies, at the same time, maintaining internal marketing activities. Parallel to uh, Angel Hub, I spent a good amount of time at tech stores, expanding uh, Greater China and Asia Pacific region. And I've been um, <clears throat> working with a lot of communities across Asia, as well as corporate to foster innovations and entrepreneurships. And um, apart from that, I also spent some time before these two firms started my own companies. And uh, I have a background in data science and growth. And uh, right now I'm <clears throat> spending most of my time looking at the no code movement. In the evening, I build side projects and I've uh, been super active on platforms and communities such as uh, Indie Hackers. That's how I met Gordon. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So very interesting. How how does one begin to get involved in venture capital, let's say? Was it something that you knew you were always interested in or did it kind of just naturally occur as you kind of got into the entrepreneurial um, ways of doing things and then growing from there? Or did you did you kind of say, okay, I, I know I want to be in venture capital, so these are the steps I'm going to take to get there? Thanks for this question. It's really thoughtful. So, I would say it was an ups and down journey, uh, but for sure, thanks to my first entrepreneurial experience around five years ago when I began my, my own company and I learned a lot how to communicate with investors, how to raise funds, how to manage different relationships with stakeholders. But eventually, I discovered myself uh, spend a lot of effort in community ecosystem buildings and working with different players around the startup ecosystem. This, and eventually I decided to, uh, to leave my own company and join other firms in leading growth, community, um, family offices, and also have a light touch on investing. So I think my, my recent uh, uh, position now at Angel Hub and also previously at Texas, although they are a prominent investment firm, venture capital, but I wouldn't say myself officially as an investor or venture capitalist, although I, I do support this area in my team, how to find companies, how to look at cap tables, how to do valuation sectors. I would say I, I pretty enjoy playing a strategic growth or marketing roles as a venture firm because they need this resource and, and skill set internally and externally when they position the firm, how to find companies, how to work with partners, how to or with syndications, et cetera. Absolutely. So, yeah, you, you mentioned how, like, the, the fact that these companies need those internal skills themselves. And from observing some of the stuff that you put out content-wise and a lot of the stuff that you do, it's, it's very much centered around, like, strategic growth, not only for companies, but also for um, individuals who are building their own projects and building their own businesses in the entrepreneurial space. So what kind of, I don't know, uh, maybe strategies or tactics, strategies is probably the word, but like what kind of strategies do you see maybe from a venture standpoint that like larger companies are taking that are also applicable to like individuals and smaller projects? I would 
definitely pick uh, Angel Hub as an example because um, we are also a setup outside. We have a small fund, so we have to raise as well. And we have been in the ecosystem for just not longer than two, two years. So uh, we, we barely um, get much attention from, from other regions or communities. So that's why we need to position ourselves. We need to build the brand of our company. And um, my team and I learn a lot from how other um, successful venture firms position their brands. And I think with the scales, there's something we can definitely apply and narrow down the scope and apply into our small firm as well. Just to pick a few examples, some uh, venture firms, um, they although they pay a lot of effort in investing and finding the, the next unicorns or raising their LP fund, et cetera, but they also spend a lot of time on creating content, educational materials, and educate how investors can join the ecosystem, educating how entrepreneurs can, can raise funds and, and manage their portfolio, et cetera. There's a few uh, venture firms which I admire a lot, uh, such as Open Views Partners. They uh, really focus on finding product late growth companies. So that's why if you look at their website, they rarely talk about investment, but they talk about a lot of growth products, interviewing their entrepreneurs, interviewing their portfolio companies, etc. And I think with all this storytelling and brand building, this is something where small startups can learn from. And when you start doing this gradually, you can add up a lot of uh, good traffic and attention from other um, firms and communities as well. Yeah, that's, that's a great point because I think a lot, of the, a lot of the process that goes into trying to build something from scratch or, or any startup or, I don't know, let's say small business that's trying to grow, I think just putting out content about your own story and your own business and how you're building it is almost as important as like the product or service that you're, that you're supplying to your end customer. I mean, it's, it's obviously a marketing tactic and a, and a, and a growth play, but um, yeah, just, just showing your journey and showcasing what you're doing is um, yeah, it's, it's a great way to, to collaborate with others and, and show what you're doing and putting yourself out there. And I think you do an excellent job of that yourself as well. So um, it's obviously, uh, yeah, it's obviously kind of filtering down from what you're seeing going on around you as well. Um, cool. So what would be kind of Angel Hub's main focus then in terms of like, do, do you have like specific areas that, or people or companies that you like to invest in over others? Or do you have certain niches or industries that you really focus on, I guess? I think the three major elements where we can cover. Um, first, um, we position ourselves as a hybrid venture firm. So we are not exactly a venture capital and we are not exactly investing angel fund, although we have an angel in our brand name, but we actually investing 80% um, of our fund to series A companies, pre-A companies, and rest of the rest of the fund, 20% we allocate to a later stage company like series B or plus. And regarding the investment framework, uh, because we are an investment platform, so we have our fund at the same time, we onboard accredited investors, high net worth individuals, as well as family offices. And there's no VC, no PE, no uh, corporate fund. Um, you can consider ourselves like a marketplace platform framework pro uh, format where more or less similar to Kickstarters or this type of crowdfunding company, but in equity base. So whenever we look at companies, we do um, the normal due diligence process. And once we verify a company where we want to pay more attention, so we will publish a campaign and see if the investors on our platform are willing to contribute. And the minimum ticket size per investor is like 10K US dollars. And we per campaign, we invest from 500,000 US all the way to 2 million. So I think um, this is also being classified as alternative investment in the startup investment spectrum. So there's angel fund, family fund, corporate fund, then uh, private equity, uh, maybe government grant, if you also consider it as, as, as fund or investment. And now there's equity crowdfunding and hybrid firm. Mm -hmm. And we are considered at this uh, last period. And I think the last thing I want to mention is... Um, we also uh, pay a lot of effort to, to scout CalFund. So when I say CalFund means 
um, say if a company they manage to raise uh, Series A, say the target is uh, 20 million, for example, uh, they put in several venture funds and or maybe independent investors and they manage to compensate 90 million out of 20. So we play a role to participate the last chunk of investment um, out of uh, the whole investment uh, commitment. Mm -hmm. And um, I think my team and also our partners are really specialized uh, in terms of finding these deals. So we can always participate in uh, some nice cap table and also companies who are more promising. Cool. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, I'm not I'm not extremely well versed in the whole venture capital space, but from a yeah, from like a macro trend perspective, you're obviously seeing some some insights into how it's changing, I guess, and how different venture capital firms are taking different approaches to not only the types of companies they're investing in, but also the process by which they're investing and um, taking on that like kind of hybrid model. Um, so I guess then what, like, do you see, do you see like a swing in the industry towards funding certain types of companies that are, I don't know, more collaborative or more um, like, are there any characteristics I'd say of the, of the types of organizations or, or companies that, you see getting invested in not just by um, Angel Hub, but by venture capital firms in general um, at the moment. Yeah, I think this is also another strategic considerations. And I, I tend to agree with collaborations because at the end, sharing resources, best practices, knowledge is always welcome. And as a connected community, as a startup ecosystem, helping each other sharing resources is really crucial. So no matter you are investing or doing side projects or running a passion community. And in investment game, I think there's more considerations apart from collaborations. You have to think about how you can create a collective portfolio of your companies, how you manage to recycle your funds, whether these firms and the other firms have certain associations to each other. If you manage to lock in uh, platforms like uh, Crunchbase, looking at the investment data on a daily basis, you might realize this if this is a trend where certain companies want to invest in, uh, with certain firms altogether. Maybe they have successful stories before. Maybe they realize this fund has certain potential to work with this firm, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So these uh, phenomena is pretty common in the uh, investment game. And there's also a lot of layers. So when we consider early stage, mid stage, pre-IPOs, and all the way to uh, merchant acquisition, there's so many players around these layers where you can always see people working with each other. There's, you can always see um, startups referring the, the investor to, to a certain startups where they can eventually join the portfolio and, and generate a greater impact. So mm -hmm. this is happening, and I do agree and recommend companies to um, really look at more collaborations, not just do your own, but be open-minded and work with um, others. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's an extremely important point for early stage companies and entrepreneurs as well. Just, yeah, collaborating and helping one another out. Something I, I've, I've definitely missed on in the past, I guess, when I've tried to start different projects myself. But uh, embracing it a lot more now for sure um so yeah maybe you can tell us a little bit more about some of the other things that you're working on um in terms of both virtual mojitos and slides maybe or you can touch on whichever ones you want but um like i know that these are kind of more like your passion projects that you that you like to work on on the side like you said um, um obviously you can bring some great insights from everything that you do in the venture capital space to uh, to those projects and you do a great job of sharing that so um yeah can you give us some insight into those yeah sure uh, why don't we start with why so i think um circle back to five years ago when i began my entrepreneur's journey started my first company uh, we founded a company without any technical co-founders but we managed to validate the idea build our own prototype and also uh, put in some external resources to make the product possible. And during this process, we realized the importance of, although we don't have a tech co-founder, but the, the, the excuse is not big enough where we should start. We should really move forward. We should really persuade our journey. So for that reason, um, we um, 
we ask ourselves, why don't we pick up the skills and at least we, we learn something. We don't have to be a coder, uh, mm-hmm. although we complete a certain academies, but that doesn't mean I want to become a coder in, in the future. But this process um, allow us to understand the importance of how to communicate with people out of your discipline. So if in case if I onboard a tech co-founder or maybe I have a future studio joining my team, I need to understand how to communicate with him because we have different ways of doing things. As a coder, of course, they have their own agenda and also um, ways of working. I can't expect as a marketing person, the way we do things is the same as how technical people. So by learning how to code, by learning how to make use of all these uh, technical terms, we realize that the pain of developers as well. We realize we shouldn't push them. And I took the lesson a lot, like having a new skills allows me to communicate with more people, allow me to unlock the, the potential of my network. And now um, the second story began, I think, around three years ago when I want to start a side project, which heavily relied on UI design or, or UX design, etc. I do have friends around me, but however, I couldn't find someone where we can really work together. So I was like, let's pick up the skill. And uh, I begin reading case studies on, on Medium, following a few design influences on YouTube, watching the videos, and eventually I subscribe some, some tools like sketch inventions and start practicing design. And now, um, fast forward three years, I'm also teaching at universities and, and tech bootcamp and UI UX design as a side project mm-hmm. and, and passive income. So these two lessons educating, educated me where um, don't stop learning, um, having a new skill is nice and uh, learning new skills keep myself motivated. Mm-hmm. And um, circle back to the side projects we, we mentioned where we want to touch right now. Is mm-hmm. Yeah, last I think- year I started my- before you yes. jump into that, though, it's it's a great point because you you noticed that you didn't have a particular skill, but you still didn't let that stop you from going to, let's say, build something and take it to the next level. Yeah. You went out and, and upskilled yourself. And I think, like you mentioned, you are focusing a lot on the no code space now. And it's uh, it's great because it, it the no code space lends itself to allowing so many different types of creators and entrepreneurs to go and start something and build something without the need to be technical and without the need to understand code or know how to know, know much technical details. So um, yeah, it's a great, a great lesson learned and it just shows that uh, there's so much opportunity there for, for people to do that. Yeah, exactly. And I really enjoy the journey of learning new stuff. And the thing I was thinking about is if, if any audience right here are still working on your, your full-time job, uh, in a very specific function, say uh, marketing operations or, or sales. So you spend like eight, nine hours a day to do the things you might be good at or you are doing for the sake of salary. But think about whether you want to do the same in the next 10, 20 years. I think the, the answer for me is definitely a big no. I'm always eager to change. I'm always eager to advance myself where I can scale myself to, to other areas which I'm less familiar with. And once I do, because I spend a lot of time to learn by my own, and in five years, I can tell people, hey, I can also do uh, this area, I can support, I can help, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And um, I think a small uh, steps every day will eventually add up and help you advance into certain rare area where you never uh, discover or, or thought about before. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So... How do you see, um, how, how, like, how are you developing then these these projects that you're working on? And like, I've obviously had a look at Virtual Mojito and like, um, I think that's the one you're, you're working on most at the moment, if I'm correct. But um, yes, absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah, maybe give us a, give us a bit of an insight into. Uh, into sure, that. I think the certain things, um, virtualmojito.com is my recent project where, uh, thanks, but Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, uh, we have to, you know, lock down, we stay at home, we work from home, and I was trying my best to stay uh, motivated. And also with this um, pandemic speeds up remote working and uh, webinar culture, virtual events a lot. If we think back like last year, if you put up a webinar, you really get maybe five people. Now, mm-hmm. if you put up a virtual event, you can get like 500 people easily. So 
And at the same time, a lot of virtual events, technologies pop up. Recently, Hopin raised 40 million Series A. Uh, to respect this other virtual events keep coming back. If you lock in Product Hunt, there's a new virtual events to every day. Mm -hmm. So there's opportunity out there. And I really want to give these people extra spotlight and um, consolidate content around virtual events and, and uh, remote working. And uh, at the same time, I found a nice domain, like Fresh Home Mojito, and I was like, oh, how can I uh, leverage this domain and, and do something? And I was like, okay, let's build maybe a depository to um, consolidate all these tools, help people uh, make uh, right decisions in terms of choosing a resource for virtual events, how to find a Zoom alternatives, and blah, blah, blah. And that's how I made it. I spent uh, two hours a day, a week, and uh, eventually I make a uh, virtual mojito possible. It's been uh, a month yesterday. Mm -hmm. So it was a really nice journey. I keep building and consolidating content and also interact with people who are also in the same space as well. And it was really cool. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So do you, um, you mentioned there, obviously the fact that the pandemic is accelerating the rate at which people are interacting virtually online as well and all that. So, um, you're obviously front and center for seeing all the tools that are helping to facilitate that. Um, and it was, it was crazy just to see the numbers with even like Zoom and the, the amount of people that were using it and the revenue over like the space of March, April, May, I think. But um, yeah, I guess what are like, aside from maybe virtual events tools and, and all of um, live events, what are some other tools maybe that you're seeing that are helping to I don't know, maybe promote like the future of remote work or um, anything that's kind of popped up for you that is a really cool idea or maybe kind of like the macro trends with, with those kind of tools that you see facilitating. One, one thing I've seen, for example, is like a lot of um, marketplaces, especially for like peer-to-peer -peer and helping with like mentorship for people who are yeah. wanting to work together and collaborate. So um, yeah, that was just, that's just one example, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I would definitely uh, pay more attention to uh, remote working and also virtual collaborations. I think these two areas have been exist for decades already, like mm -hmm. remote working tools, like collaborative, there's so many productivity tools out there. But with this pandemic, it speeds up the, the mindset of people. People are more willing to have distributed teams. People are more willing to hire people out of their time zone. So I think these technologies and also industries will eventually evolve into a more uh, structure, into a more um, uh, formalized um, uh, bubble where people will compare with other industries as well. I started to see we are heading to these directions, like more tools, more opportunities, more capital coming in, more companies are ready to subscribe these tools and people are started or maybe forced to familiar with these tools as well so all these requirements will eventually speed up a lot and that's why companies manage to raise good funds uh, you know sustain the finance and also maintain the productivity by using all these resources available mm -hmm. absolutely it's a it's a great time to be an entrepreneur i guess in this space as well because there are so many tools that are available to to entrepreneurs and solopreneurs and freelancers and it's kind of a matter of thinking about the ones that are go, going to serve your business best and um combining different tools to create workflows that assist you on, on your business from an efficiency standpoint but also from like a functional standpoint for the stuff that we mentioned from the no code movement earlier um yeah so with with virtual mojitos and and slides like what what kind of stage do you see them being at? I know you're still early stages, let's say, with virtual mojitos, but is the vision to kind of just continue to to grow those organically, or would you like to kind of see what like are you are you kind of growing them and then seeing what's going to happen, or do you have like intentions further down the line for huh. for any of them? I think my first principle is um, passion project will be still a person project unless it takes off or validated other area which I should tap into. I don't seem to see I'm at this stage right now, 
but I really enjoy uh, spending a small amount of time every day, every week to contribute in my own projects and um, not just for the sake of uh, getting income or uh, more users, but it, I learn a lot from this building and routine and having a discipline of working on things that I love, enjoy, and I, I feel really satisfied. Uh, <clears throat> but at the same time, I also trust how uh, data educate myself, uh, which direction I should go to. And it seems like uh, the virtual multi-tool is getting more and more attentions from other people, communities. Uh, the, the tools are being featured on the platforms. The vendors are sending me messages. I think it's a good sign where we can do more stuff. Um, people keep submitting events on the calendar. I start to realize um, the uh, daily or monthly active um, you know, users are getting uh, more stable and stable. So I think I would definitely um, try to drill down a little bit more and see uh, which directions I should go for. And I think uh, this week I will focus on working on my uh, first month uh, breakdown run up and uh, mm -hmm. discuss all the learnings, all the mistakes, and also how other no coders can um, do stuff and also uh, work with each other. For sure. It's nice that you can, like you're getting feedback already and it's nice that the type of resource that it is means that people people want to uh, collaborate on it and they can they can share their own tools, but it also allows you to kind of monitor organically what's the best direction to take it as as it grows because like you said, it's already naturally growing over the past month and it'll it'll probably become more apparent as time goes forward how how you can best like position it to uh, to go in the direction that you want yeah. Um, that's awesome. Great. <laughs> so, no um, so growth marketing is obviously an area that you are quite proficient in. So maybe like we can talk a bit about that for a minute and maybe for anyone who isn't familiar with like the definition for growth marketing, how would you kind of define it for, uh, for people? Sure. The first things I often say is growth is fancy. It's a password. It's a buzzword where people mislead a lot, mm -hmm. especially startups and also people who are trying to take advantage from owning this title. Mm -hmm. I am in between love it and hate it. Uh, <laughs> but in short, I usually separate and consider growth as um, from four major pillars. So starting from the ability to understand, organize, and generate insights from data. Secondly, the ability to connect a technical uh, resource such as integrating software, finding your own tech stack for different uh, experiments, different industries or products. So mm -hmm. just to give a quick example, say Zapier, integral map, like integrating resources, communicating each other, making sure data are transparent enough where you can uh, foster uh, your decision-making process in, in, in growth or marketing. And third item I would definitely consider is the ability of understanding users. So either design, either research, either persona, either empathy, and how you translate all these uh, users' relationships into value propositions. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, the way to generate creative marketing, like how you can leverage content, visuals, how you can leverage experiments to attract people to onboard your product, your, your marketing, your, your um, processes, etc. And when you manage to combine all these four items, you can create a nice growth engines around almost every industry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. That is a, that's a great definition because I wasn't expecting like such a, a detailed breakdown of what is involved with growth marketing, but as you were going through it, it all totally makes sense, you know? Um, from one perspective, you could say that, yeah, in its simplest form, it's just um, helping a business or a personal brand to, to grow. But um, obviously, with all your experience and um, knowledge so far, like you can, like you, you've, you've broken it down into all those kind of key components for um, taking a business to the next level. And like you said, creating a growth engine. Can you, can you maybe like expand on that a little bit? Like, Oh, I guess, I'm guessing all those components kind of fit together to create a growth engine, but what would a, like, it obviously takes a bit of time to get to that point where someone or a business has 
all of those pillars aligned to be, um, I don't know, I guess, motoring uh, with their growth engine? <laughs> yeah, I think there's a few popular and well-adopted principles out there. I think the first principle people usually look at is the funnel, like how mm -hmm. you can convert um, a strangers, like maybe uh, a market where you're not familiar with uh, and all the way to your loyal user. And it takes a lot of layers, like how you can um, draw attention for your brand, how you can acquire customers to maybe, let's say, sign up or subscribe to anything, how you can make sure your users are active, keep coming back to your product, how you can ensure your users also talk about your products, refer their friends and families, and eventually convert these people into a loyal customers where you can get income and get paid from, from them. And it takes a lot of effort from, from the beginning all the way down to the bottom funnel. And this is what we call the growth funnel. Uh, the second principle we look at is um, T-shaped marketing. So mm -hmm. basically, um, if you Google it like T-shaped marketing, you can find lots of uh, content generated by a growth agency in Netherlands called Growth Tribe. So it's a growth hacking academy where mm -hmm. they're really uh, popular on LinkedIn as well. And uh, they basically categorize a lot of key components into a T-shape where it describes um, how much you should understand vertically and also uh, horizontally, mm -hmm. such as all the uh, normal marketing terms we use like SEO content, PR, UX, prototyping, A-B testing, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think as a growth marketer or, or growth hacker, it's nice if you know most of the components, but it's also really important to specialize in maybe one or two key areas. Mm -hmm. um, in a small startup setting, I think you're recommended to know as much as possible. But in a big tech company like Dropbox, Airbnb, Deliveroo, they have a huge growth team where everyone is specialized in one or two area. Mm -hmm. And when they combine, they support each other, they know how to fit all these skill sets into a funnel and eventually manage to con uh, convert into numbers so that they can measure the success and make further decisions. And uh, the last item I would definitely suggest to look at is uh, North Star metric. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we talk about North Star metrics, uh, this is um, a primary metrics that are now many metrics that you're measuring. But the difference is North Star metrics help you and your team define what success actually looks like. And I actually talked about this uh, this morning with my team. I used um, uh, Spotify as an example, like music streaming. Mm -hmm. And how they do, how they define North Star metric is pretty simple. They look at how often do people look, uh, listen to, to music. And in, in the definition, uh, what I learned is they consider um, if a single person listen to um, uh, one hour music every week, they will consider these user as an active users. So the hypothesis is pretty simple, how they can make sure more people listen to music on Spotify longer than one hour or maybe mm -hmm. one hour. So they collect a lot of user behavior and generate customizations, personalizations, and making sure every time when you log in the dashboard, you see the music where you might want to listen to, mm -hmm. customized playlists, recommendation, uh, the, the, the singers, the songwriters, or the types of music you might eventually want to spend time. Mm -hmm. So the more they do these personalizations, the more they learn your behavior, you start to realize, okay, I should listen to more music maybe. And then once you fall into this hook, you will eventually uh, jump into the one hour um, line of mm -hmm. activated users. So if you're still if you are still a freemium user on Spotify, like every three minutes you get an advertisement. So with, you will mm -hmm. increase the chance of getting rid of this advertisement and become a premium user eventually. So I think they use this metric to define how to push more people to listen to music at least one hour a week by doing a lot of personalization behind. But I assume they, they do way more than personalizations. Yeah. And they are doing a really good job in just making one product and do it great. Yeah, I think Spotify is a, is a great success story on that front. The, so you spoke about how, like, of course, companies the size of Spotify or Dropbox have entire teams mm -hmm. dedicated to uh, very specific ways of 
um, understanding people and personas and all that. So maybe, I don't know, if you can think about, is there any ways that those processes can be applied for um, startups or small businesses or, or entrepreneurs? How can, like, how can we take something from like learning it, learning something like that, that Spotify does and, and implement it for ourselves? Obviously not on the same scale, but um, yeah, is there, is there anything you can see that, that would help to do that? Yeah, quick questions. I I have experience uh, as a team of one in the marketing team. I also mm-hmm. have experience in a team of 30. Mm-hmm. So much different. And I think um, this is how I formalize the marketing structures. I usually start um, a discovery stage. Like before you assume anything, before you put out any experience or hypothesis, it's really important for you to spend some time, take a step back to to understand what exactly is the business model, what is the pain points, how can you make your company, how can you make all the operations more efficient before you move forward to <clears throat> suggest any marketing activities. So I tend to agree with separating marketing into uh, different functions. And right now, actually, at Angel Hub, we separate into six major functions. So starting from social media, email, um, content, search, including PPC, and also analytics, and last but not least, uh, rapid prototyping. Mm-hmm. Because as a growth team, you have to basically build everything from scratch and all yeah. the way to ship and test. Yeah. So it's really sure. important to have these major elements in your growth team, where you can support each other. And if unfortunately you're a team of one, you are expected to basically learn and execute all these items. And once you pass the discovery stage, you can start looking at whether I can translate these elements into an experiment format or maybe into funnel format. And then you can, you can start paying more attention towards the, the growth funnel we have discussed earlier, earlier by putting mm-hmm. in, for example, I use maybe say uh, social media and email to uh, fulfill my top funnel. Or it, we need to activate users. Maybe you, we do more um, uh, maybe search or maybe content example. So it's really depending on your industry and your products and there's no golden rule. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, yeah. It's it's nice to be able to, I guess, somewhat map what what's happening on a larger scale back down to a more micro scale. And um, I definitely always find it interesting to be able to to take those learnings from what like larger companies are doing because they've got the manpower. But like, I think smaller teams have the ability to be a bit more agile and a bit more nimble and 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 quick in the way that they can implement things. So it's uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's cool to do like a comparison. Um, yeah, so you also mentioned like about um, the kind of the T-shaped approach to growth marketing. And again, this is another thing that's it's tough to to kind of uh, decide what to do when you're a smaller team um, in terms of where do you put your time and resources into uh, growing across different platforms, let's say, because there's the trade off between kind of going deep on one or two or trying to spread yourself across multiple different um, channels, I guess, to, to, to siphon back attention towards your brand. But um, what do you kind of see or recommend for smaller teams? I think the, the general consensus is that it, it's better to kind of focus on one or two and, and go deep. And then once you go deep and learn those, you kind of understand your own process and how to grow. And then you can translate that to other platforms. But I'd be interested to hear your take. Good questions. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> I think um, for me personally, uh, content and search are the last thing I do. Okay. So that's why I rely on my team, like, because we have some specialists in, in content and search. I will be sort of like a supporter in this area instead of a leader. And instead, I'm more like an email and uh, pay advertisement person. And secondly, uh, because I'm not in uh, native English speaker, so writing, listening, reading is extra hard for myself. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think a few years back, I decided to begin uh, a reading routine, listening routine, and eventually trying to contribute some content uh, as well to in order to to upscale myself. Mm-hmm. So I think um, I get nice to focus on multiple areas, but if you really uh, lack of resources and time, really pick one or two. And once you master certain skills, started to look back at the 
not star metric, or maybe a couple of metrics where you have decided to measure earlier and see if those marketing areas you pick up um, associate to, to the metrics itself. Mm-hmm. If not, maybe you want to persuade other experiments. If yes, maybe you want to spend more resources and investment and, and drill down a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think for people starting out, it's it's definitely a a matter of like lack of resources and trying to um yeah trying to really decide where am I going to get back get my best return on investment and and also figuring out where where's the ideal customer for my particular product or service going to be hanging out online I guess and that's probably makes up another piece of of what you try to do with growth marketing is like just trying to figure out like first of all who exactly your ideal customer is and then also figuring out where where are they hanging out and what's the um what's the type of content that I should be making or producing to uh on on the relevant platforms to kind of uh to resonate with that with that ideal customer yeah totally mhm cool um so yeah any any i suppose kind of final words of wisdom or advice for um for any kind of startups or entrepreneurs who are looking to kickstart their own business uh either from a growth marketing perspective or or from from any perspective i guess from from you and your experience yeah first thing uh really don't stop learning like mm-hmm. do not afraid to acquire new skills do not afraid to ask for help secondly join a community and people are extra willing to help especially nowadays with the situation there's a lot of communities online where people are really eager to connect and support um and i think my last word is uh, start to 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 build your own routine like no matter it's learning reading reaching out catching up with people i think every day if you manage to do a small item um you can eventually see the result in the longer run so cool. i one maybe one quick example every day i force myself to talk to three new people mhm like no Great matter is uh, yeah. people around my neighborhood online social media or someone i see on the platforms where they publish uh, interesting questions you can comment and try to extend the conversation not just comment and editing try to find a way to connect these people and see if you can generate some um interesting insights or maybe a working relationship in the future and I think that's how we started the conversation absolutely yeah with collaboration i think that's a that's a great way to circle back and finish it off <laughs> as well so um great thank you very much felix for coming on and um, if people want to check out what you're doing they can they can hit up virtualmojito.com and see um and um yeah thanks again for taking the time my mom it was uh, it was great to chat and uh have a great rest of your day no problem thank you